Hitler declares war. The Japanese onslaught on the US Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor at 7.30 a.m., local time, on Sunday, December 7, 1941, caught Berlin as completely by surprise as it did Washington. Though Hitler had made an oral promise to Matsuoka that Germany would join Japan in a war against the United States, and Ribbentrop had made another to Ambassador Oshima, the assurance had not yet been signed, and the Japanese had not breathed a word to the Germans about Pearl Harbor. Besides, at this moment, Hitler was fully occupied trying to rally his faltering generals and retreating troops in Russia. Night had fallen in Berlin when the Foreign Broadcast Monitoring Service first picked up the news of the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. When an official of the Foreign Office Press Department telephoned Ribbentrop the world-shaking news, he at first refused to believe it and was extremely angry at being disturbed. The report was, probably a propaganda trick of the enemy, he said, and ordered that he be left undisturbed until morning. So probably Ribbentrop, for once, told the truth when he testified on the stand at Nuremberg that this attack came as a complete surprise to us. We had considered the possibility of Japan's attacking Singapore or perhaps Hong Kong, but we never considered an attack on the United States as being to our advantage. However, contrary to what he told the tribunal, he was exceedingly happy about it, or so he struck Chiano. A night telephone call from Ribbentrop Chiano began his diary on December 8th, he is joyful over the Japanese attack on the United States. He is so happy, in fact, that I can't but congratulate him, even though I am not so sure about the advantage. Mussolini was also happy. For a long time now, he has been in favour of clarifying the position between America and the Axis. At 1pm on Monday, December 8th, General Oshima went to the Wilhelmstrasse to get Ribbentrop to clarify Germany's position. He demanded a formal declaration of war on the United States at once. Ribbentrop replied Oshima radioed Tokyo that Hitler was then in the midst of a conference at General Headquarters discussing how the formalities of declaring war could be carried out so as to make a good impression on the German people, and that he would transmit your wish to him at once and do whatever he was able to have it carried out promptly. The Nazi foreign minister also informed the ambassador, according to the latter's message to Tokyo, that on that very morning of the 8th, Hitler issued orders to the German Navy to attack American ships whenever and wherever they may meet them. But the dictator stalled on a declaration of war. The Führer, according to the notation in his daily calendar book, hurried back to Berlin on the night of December 8th, arriving there at 11 o'clock the next morning. Ribbentrop claimed at Nuremberg that he pointed out to the leader that Germany did not necessarily have to declare war on America under the terms of the Tripartite Pact since Japan was obviously the aggressor. The text of the Tripartite Pact bound us to assist Japan only in case of an attack against Japan herself. I went to see the Führer, explained the legal aspect of the situation, and told him that, although we welcomed a new ally against England, it meant we had a new opponent to deal with as well if we declared war on the United States. I told him that according to the stipulation of the Three Power Pact, since Japan had attacked, we would not have to declare war formally. The Führer thought this matter over quite a while, and then he gave me a very clear decision. If we don't stand on the side of Japan, he said, the pact is politically dead. But that is not the main reason. The chief reason is that the United States already is shooting against our ships. They have been a forceful factor in this war, and through their actions have already created a situation of war. The Führer was of the opinion at that moment that it was quite evident that the United States would now make war against Germany. Therefore, he ordered me to hand over the passports to the American representative. This was a decision that Roosevelt and Hull in Washington had been confidently waiting for. There had been some pressure on them to have Congress declare war on Germany and Italy on December 8th, when that step was taken against Japan. But they had decided to wait. The bombing at Pearl Harbor had taken them off one hook and certain information in their possession led them to believe that the headstrong Nazi dictator would take them off a second hook. They had pondered the intercepted message of Ambassador Oshima from Berlin to Tokyo on November 29th, in which Ribbentrop had assured the Japan ESE that Germany would join Japan if she became engaged in a war against the United States. There was nothing in that assurance which made German aid conditional upon who was the aggressor. It was a blank check, and the Americans had no doubt that the Japanese were now clamouring in Berlin that it be honoured, 
It was honoured, but only after the Nazi warlord again hesitated. He had convoked the Reichstag to meet on December 9th, the day of his arrival in Berlin, but he postponed it for two days until the 11th. Apparently, as Ribbentrop later reported, he had made up his mind. He was fed up with the attacks made by Roosevelt on him and on Nazism. His patience was exhausted by the warlike acts of the US Navy against German U-boats in the Atlantic, about which Raider had continually nagged him for nearly a year. He had a growing hatred for America and Americans, and, what was worse for him in the long run, a growing tendency to disastrously underestimate the potential strength of the United States. At the same time, he grossly overestimated Japan's military power. In fact, he seems to have believed that once the Japanese, whose navy he believed to be the most powerful in the world, had disposed of the British and Americans in the Pacific, they would turn on Russia and thus help him finish his great conquest in the East. He actually told some of his followers a few months later that he thought Japan's entry into the war had been of exceptional value to us, if only because of the date chosen. It was, in effect, at the moment when the surprises of the Russian winter were pressing most heavily on the morale of our people, and when everybody in Germany was oppressed by the certainty that sooner or later the United States would come into the conflict. Japanese intervention, therefore, was, from our point of view, most opportune. There is also no doubt that Japan's sneaky and mighty blow against the American fleet at Pearl Harbor kindled his admiration, and all the more so because it was the kind of surprise he had been so proud of pulling off so often himself. He expressed this to Ambassador Oshima on December 14th, when he awarded him the Grand Cross of the Order of Merit of the German Eagle in gold. You gave the right declaration of war. This method is the only proper one. It corresponded, he said, to his own system, that is, to negotiate as long as possible. But if one sees that the other is interested only in putting one off, in shaming and humiliating one, and is not willing to come to an agreement, then one should strike indeed as hard as possible, and not waste time declaring war. It was heartwarming to him to hear of the first operations of the Japanese. He himself negotiated with infinite patience at times, for example, with Poland and also with Russia. When he then realised that the other did not want to come to an agreement, he struck suddenly and without formalities. He would continue to go this way in the future. There was one other reason for Hitler's deciding in such haste to add the United States to the formidable list of his enemies. Dr. Schmidt, who was in and out of the Chancellery and Foreign Office that week, put his finger on it. I got the impression, he later wrote, that, with his inveterate desire for prestige, Hitler, who was expecting an American declaration of war, wanted to get his declaration in first. The Nazi warlord confirmed this in his speech to the Reichstag on December 11th. We will always strike first, he told the cheering deputies. We will always deal the first blow. Indeed, Berlin was so fearful on December 10th that America might declare war first that Ribbentrop sternly admonished Thompson, the German chargey in Washington, about committing any indiscretion which might tip off the State Department to what Hitler planned to do on the following day. In a long radiogram on the 10th, the Nazi foreign minister filed the text of the declaration he would make in Berlin to the US Chargé d'Affaires at precisely 2.30pm on December 11th. Thompson was instructed to call on Hull exactly one hour later, at 3.30pm, Berlin time, hand the Secretary of State a copy of the declaration, ask for his passport, and turn over Germany's diplomatic representation to Switzerland. At the end of the message, Ribbentrop warned Thompson not to have any contact with the State Department before delivering his note. We wish to avoid under all circumstances, the warning said, that the government there beats us to such a step. Whatever hesitations led Hitler to postpone the Reichstag session by two days, it is evident from the captured exchange of messages between the Wilhelmstrasse and the German embassy in Washington and from other foreign office papers that the Führer actually made his fateful decision to declare war on the United States on December 9th, the day he arrived in the capital from headquarters on the Russian front. The Nazi dictator appears to have wanted the two extra days not for further reflection, but to prepare carefully his Reichstag speech so that it would make the proper impression on the German people of whose memories of America's decisive role in the First World War, Hitler was quite aware. Hans Diekhoff, who was still officially the German ambassador to the United States,
but who had been cooling his heels in the Wilhelmstrasse ever since both countries withdrew their chief envoys in the autumn of 1938, was put to work on December 9th to draw up a long list of Roosevelt's anti-German activities for the Führer's Reichstag address. Also on December 9th, Thompson in Washington was instructed to burn his secret codes and confidential papers. Measures carried out as ordered, he flashed to Berlin at 11.30 a.m. on that day. For the first time, he became aware of what was going on in Berlin, and during the evening tipped the Wilhelmstrasse that apparently the American government knew too. Believed here, he said, that within 24 hours Germany will declare war on the United States, or at least break off diplomatic relations. Hitler in the Reichstag, December 11th. Hitler's address on December 11th to the robots of the Reichstag in defence of his declaration of war on the United States was devoted mainly to hurling personal insults at Franklin D. Roosevelt, to charging that the president had provoked war in order to cover up the failures of the New Deal, and to thundering that this man alone, backed by the millionaires and the Jews, was responsible for the Second World War. All the accumulated pent-up resentment at a man who had stood from the first in his way toward world dominion, who had continually taunted him, who had provided massive aid to Britain at a moment when it seemed that battered island nation would fall, and whose navy was frustrating him in the Atlantic, burst forth in violent wrath. Permit me to define my attitude to that other world, which has its representative in that man who, while our soldiers are fighting in snow and ice, very tactfully likes to make his chats from the fireside, the man who is the main culprit of this war. I will pass over the insulting attacks made by this so-called president against me. That he calls me a gangster is uninteresting. After all, this expression was not coined in Europe but in America, no doubt because such gangsters are lacking here. Apart from this, I cannot be insulted by Roosevelt, for I consider him mad, just as Wilson was. First he incites war, then falsifies the causes, then odiously wraps himself in a cloak of Christian hypocrisy, and slowly but surely leads mankind to war not without calling God to witness the honesty of his attack in the approved manner of an old Freemason. Roosevelt has been guilty of a series of the worst crimes against international law. Illegal seizure of ships and other property of German and Italian nationals was coupled with the threat to, and looting of, those who were deprived of their liberty by being interned. Roosevelt's ever-increasing attacks finally went so far that he ordered the American Navy to attack everywhere ships under the German and Italian flags, and to sink them this in gross violation of international law. American ministers boasted of having destroyed German submarines in this criminal way. German and Italian merchant ships were attacked by American cruisers, captured and their crews imprisoned. In this way, the sincere efforts of Germany and Italy to prevent an extension of the war and to maintain relations with the United States in spite of the unbearable provocations which have been carried on for years by President Roosevelt have been frustrated. What was Roosevelt's motive to intensify anti-German feeling to the pitch of war? Hitler asked. He gave two explanations. I understand only too well that a worldwide distance separates Roosevelt's ideas and my ideas. Roosevelt comes from a rich family and belongs to the class whose path is smoothed in the democracies. I was only the child of a small, poor family and had to fight my way by work and industry. When the Great War came, Roosevelt occupied a position where he got to know only its pleasant consequences, enjoyed by those who do business while others bleed. I was only one of those who carried out orders as an ordinary soldier and naturally returned from the war just as poor as I was in the autumn of 1914. I shared the fate of millions, and Franklin Roosevelt only the fate of the so-called Upper 10,000. After the war, Roosevelt tried his hand at financial speculations. He made profits out of inflation, out of the misery of others, while I lay in a hospital. Hitler continued at some length with this singular comparison before he reached his second point, that Roosevelt had reverted to war to escape the consequences of his failure as president. National Socialism came to power in Germany in the same year as Roosevelt was elected president. He took over a state in a very poor economic condition, and I took over the Reich faced with complete ruin thanks to democracy. While an unprecedented revival of economic life, culture and art took place in Germany under National Socialist leadership, President Roosevelt did not succeed in bringing about even the slightest improvement in his own country. This is not surprising if one bears in mind that the men he had called to support him, or rather the men who had called him, 
belonged to the Jewish element, whose interests are all for disintegration and never for order. Roosevelt's New Deal legislation was all wrong. There can be no doubt that a continuation of this economic policy would have undone this president in peacetime, in spite of all his dialectical skill. In a European state, he would surely have come eventually before a state court on a charge of deliberate waste of the national wealth, and he would scarcely have escaped at the hands of a civil court on a charge of criminal business methods. Hitler knew that this assessment of the New Deal was shared, in part at least, by the American isolationists and a considerable portion of the business community, and he sought to make the most of it, ignorant of the fact that on Pearl Harbor Day these groups, like all others in America, had rallied to the support of their country. This fact was realized he continued, alluding to these groups and fully appreciated by many Americans, including some of high standing. A threatening opposition was gathering over the head of this man. He guessed that the only salvation for him lay in diverting public attention from home to foreign policy. He was strengthened in this by the Jews around him. The full diabolical meanness of Jewry rallied around this man and he stretched out his hands. Thus began the increasing efforts of the American president to create conflicts. For years this man harboured one desire that a conflict should break out somewhere in the world. There followed a long recital of Roosevelt's efforts in this direction, beginning with the quarantine speech in Chicago in 1937. Now he Roosevelt is seized, Hitler cried at one point, with fear that if peace is brought about in Europe his squandering of millions of money on armaments will be looked upon as plain fraud, since nobody will attack America, and then he himself must provoke this attack upon his country. The Nazi dictator seemed relieved that the break had come, and he sought to share his sense of relief with the German people. I think you have all found it a relief now that, at last, one state has been the first to take the step of protesting against this historically unique and shameless ill-treatment of truth and of right. The fact that the Japanese government, which has been negotiating for years with this man, has at last become tired of being mocked by him in such an unworthy way fills us all, the German people, and I think all other decent people in the world, with deep satisfaction. The President of the United States ought finally to understand, I say this only because of his limited intellect that we know that the aim of his struggle is to destroy one state after another. As for the German nation, it needs charity neither from Mr. Roosevelt nor from Mr. Churchill, let alone from Mr. Eden. It wants only its rights. It will secure for itself this right to live even if thousands of Churchills and Roosevelts conspire against it. I have therefore arranged for passports to be handed to the American Chargé d'Affaires today, and the following. At this point the deputies of the Reichstag leaped to their feet cheering, and the Führer's words were drowned in the bedlam. Shortly afterward, at 2.30pm, Ribbentrop, in one of his most frigid poses, received Leland Morris, the American Chargé d'Affaires in Berlin, and while keeping him standing read out Germany's declaration of war, handed him a copy and icily dismissed him. Although Germany for her part said the Declaration has always strictly observed the rules of international law in her dealings with the United States throughout the present war, the government of the United States has finally proceeded to overt acts of war against Germany. It has, therefore, virtually created a state of war. The Reich government therefore breaks off all diplomatic relations with the United States and declares that under these circumstances brought about by President Roosevelt, Germany too considers herself to be at war with the United States as from today. The final act in the day's drama was the signing of a tripartite agreement by Germany, Italy and Japan, declaring their unshakable determination not to lay down arms until the joint war against the United States and England reaches a successful conclusion, and not to conclude a separate peace. Adolf Hitler, who a bare six months before had faced only a beleaguered Britain in a war which seemed to him as good as won, now, by deliberate choice, had arrayed against him the three greatest industrial powers in the world in a struggle in which military might depended largely, in the long run, on economic strength. Those three enemy countries together also had a great preponderance of manpower over the three Axis nations. Neither Hitler nor his generals nor his admirals seem to have weighed those sobering facts on that eventful December day as the year 1941 drew toward a close. General Hulder, the intelligent chief of the general staff, did not even note in his diary on December 11th that Germany had declared war on the United States. 
He mentioned only that in the evening he attended a lecture by a naval captain on the background of the Japanese-American Sea War. The rest of his diary, understandably perhaps, was taken up with the continued bad news from most sectors of the hard-pressed Russian front. There was no room in his thoughts for an eventual day when his weakened armies might also have to confront fresh troops from the New World. Admiral Raider actually welcomed Hitler's move. He conferred with the Führer on the following day, December 12th. The situation in the Atlantic, he assured him, will be eased by Japan's successful intervention. And warming up to his subject, he added, reports have already been received of the transfer of some American battleships from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It is certain that light forces, especially destroyers, will be required in increased numbers in the Pacific. The need for transport ships will be very great, so that a withdrawal of American merchant ships from the Atlantic can be expected. The strain on British merchant shipping will increase. Hitler, having taken his plunge, and with such reckless bravado, now suddenly was prey to doubts. He had some questions to put to the Grand Admiral. Did he believe that the enemy will in the near future take steps to occupy the Azores, the Cape Verdes, and perhaps even to attack Dakar, in order to win back prestige lost as the result of the setbacks in the Pacific? Raider did not think so. The US, he answered, will have to concentrate all her strength in the Pacific during the next few months. Britain will not want to run any risks after her severe losses of big ships. It is hardly likely that transport tonnage is available for such occupation tasks or for bringing up supplies. Hitler had a more important question to pose. Is there any possibility, he asked, that the USA and Britain will abandon East Asia for a time in order to crush Germany and Italy first? Here again the Grand Admiral was reassuring. It is improbable, he answered, that the enemy will give up East Asia even temporarily. By so doing, Britain would endanger India very seriously, and the US cannot withdraw her fleet from the Pacific as long as the Japanese fleet has the upper hand. Raider further tried to cheer up the Führer by informing him that six large submarines were to proceed as quickly as possible to the east coast of the United States. With the situation in Russia being what it was, not to mention that in North Africa, where Rommel was also retreating, the thoughts of the German supreme commander and his military chiefs quickly turned from the new enemy, which they were sure would have its hands full in the Pacific far away. Their thoughts were not to return to it before another year had passed, the most fateful year of the war, in which the great turning point would come irrevocably deciding not only the outcome of the conflict which all through 1941 the Germans had believed almost over, almost won, but the fate of the Third Reich, whose astounding early victories had raised it so quickly to such a giddy height, and which Hitler sincerely believed and said would flourish for a thousand years. Holder's scribblings in his diary grew ominous as New Year's 1942 drew near. Another dark day, he began his journal on December 30th, 1941, and again on the last day of the year. The chief of the German general staff had a presentiment of terrible things to come, the great turning point, 1942, Stalingrad and El Alamein. The conspirators come back to life. The severe setback to Hitler's armies in Russia during the winter of 1941-42 and the cashiering of a number of field marshals and top generals ignited the hopes of the anti-Nazi conspirators again. They had been unable to interest the leading commanders in a revolt as long as their armies were smashing to one easy victory after another and the glory of German arms and of the German Reich was soaring to the heavens. But now the proud and hitherto invincible soldiers were falling back in the snow and bitter cold before an enemy which had proved their match. Casualties in six months had passed the million mark, and a host of the most renowned generals were being summarily dismissed, some of them, such as Hopner and Sponnick, publicly disgraced, and most of the others humiliated and made scapegoats of by the ruthless dictator. The time is almost ripe, Hassel concluded hopefully in his diary on December 21st, 1941. He and his fellow conspirators were sure that the Prussian officer corps would react not only to their shabby treatment, but to the madness of their supreme commander in leading them and their armies to the brink of disaster in the Russian winter. The plotters had long been convinced, as we have seen, that only the generals, in command of troops, had the physical power to overthrow the Nazi tyrant. Now was their chance before it was too late. Timing was all important. The war, they saw, after the reverses in Russia and the entry of America into the conflict, could no longer be won. 
but neither was it yet lost. An anti-Nazi government in Berlin could still get peace terms, they thought, which would leave Germany a major power, and perhaps with at least some of Hitler's gains, such as Austria, the Sudetenland and Western Poland. These thoughts had been very much in their minds at the end of the summer of 1941, even when the prospect of destroying the Soviet Union was still good. The text of the Atlantic Charter, which Churchill and Roosevelt had drawn up on August 19th, had come as a heavy blow to them, especially Point 8, which had stipulated that Germany would have to be disarmed after the war pending a general disarmament agreement. To Hassel, Girdler, Beck and the other members of their opposition circle, this meant that the Allies had no intention of distinguishing between Nazi and anti-Nazi Germans, and was proof, as Hassel put it, that England and America are not fighting only against Hitler, but also want to smash Germany and render her defenceless. Indeed, to this aristocratic former ambassador, now deep in treason against Hitler, but determined to get as much as possible for a Germany without Hitler, point eight, as he noted in his journal, destroys every reasonable chance for peace. Disillusioned though they were by the Atlantic Charter, the conspirators seem to have been spurred to action by its promulgation, if only because it impressed them with the necessity of doing away with Hitler, while there was yet time for an anti-Nazi regime to bargain advantageously for peace for a Germany which still held most of Europe. They were not adverse to using Hitler's conquests to obtain the most favourable terms for their country. The upshot of a series of talks in Berlin during the last days of August between Hassel, Popitz, Oster, Donagny and General Friedrich Olbricht, Chief of Staff of the Home Army, was that the German patriots, as they called themselves, would make very moderate demands of the Allies. But to quote Hassel again, there are certain claims from which they could not desist. What the demands and claims were, he does not say. One gathers from other entries in his diary that they amounted to an insistence on Germany's 1914 frontiers in the east, plus Austria and the Sudetenland. But time pressed. After a final conference with his confederates at the end of August, Hassel wrote in his diary, they were unanimously convinced that it would soon be too late. When our chances for victory are obviously gone or only very slim, there will be nothing more to be done. There had been some effort to induce key generals on the Eastern Front to arrest Hitler during the summer campaign in Russia. But though it inevitably proved ineffectual, because the great captains were naturally too absorbed in their initial stunning victories to give any thought to overthrowing the man who had given them the opportunity to achieve them, it did plant some seeds among the military minds that would eventually sprout. The centre of the conspiracy in the army that summer was in the headquarters of Field Marshal von Bock, whose army group centre was driving on Moscow. Major General Henning von Treskow of Bock's staff, whose early enthusiasm for National Socialism had so soured as to land him in the ranks of the plotters, was the ringleader, and he was assisted by Fabian von Schlabrendorf, his ADC, and by two fellow conspirators whom they had planted on Bock as a DCs, Count Hans von Hardenberg and Count Heinrich von Lendorf, both scions of old and prominent German families. One of their self-appointed tasks was to work on the field marshal and to persuade him to arrest Hitler on one of his visits to the army group's headquarters. But Bock was hard to work on. Though professing to loathe Nazism, he had advanced too far under it and was much too vain and ambitious to take any chances at this stage of the game. Once, when Tresco tried to point out to him that the Führer was leading the country to disaster, Bock shouted, I do not allow the Führer to be attacked. Tresco and his young aide were discouraged but not daunted. They decided to act on their own. When on August 4th, 1941, the Führer visited the army group's headquarters at Borisov, they planned to seize him as he was driving from the airfield to box quarters. But the plotters were still amateurs at this time and had not counted on the Führer's security arrangements. Surrounded by his own SS bodyguards and declining to use one of the army group's automobiles to drive in from the airfield, he had sent ahead his own fleet of cars. For this purpose, he gave the two officers no opportunity of getting near him. This fiasco, apparently there were others like it taught the plotters who were in the army some lessons. The first was that to get their hands on Hitler was no easy job. He was always well guarded. Another was that to seize him and arrest him might not solve the problem, since the key generals were too cowardly or too confused about their oaths of allegiance to help the opposition to carry on from there. 
It was about this time, the fall of 1941, that some of the young officers in the army, many of them civilians in uniform like Schlabrendorf, reluctantly came to the conclusion that the simplest and perhaps the only solution was to kill Hitler. Then the timid generals, released from their personal oaths to the leader, would go along with the new regime and give it the support of the army. But the ringleaders in Berlin were not yet ready to go so far. They were concocting an idiotic plan called isolated action, which for some reason they thought would satisfy the consciences of the generals about breaking their personal oaths to the Führer and at the same time enable them to rid the Reich of Hitler. It is difficult, even today, to follow their minds in this, but the idea was that the top military commanders, both in the East and in the West, would simply, on a prearranged signal, refuse to obey the orders of Hitler as commander-in-chief of the army. This, of course, would have been breaking their oath of obedience to the Führer, but the sophists in Berlin pretended not to see that. They explained, at any event, that the real purpose of the scheme was to create confusion, in the midst of which Beck, with the help of detachments of the Home Army in Berlin, would seize power, depose Hitler and outlaw National Socialism. The Home Army, however, was scarcely a military force, but more a motley collection of recruits doing a little basic training before being shipped as replacements to the front. Some top generals in Russia or in the occupation zones who had seasoned troops at their command would have to be won over if the venture were really to succeed. One of them, who had been in on the Hulda plot to arrest Hitler at the time of Munich, seemed a natural choice. This was Field Marshal von Witzleben, who was now Commander-in-Chief in the West. To initiate him, and also General Alexander von Falkenhausen, the military commander in Belgium, into the new scheme of things Hassel was sent by the conspirators in mid-January 1942 to confer with the two generals. Already under surveillance by the Gestapo, the former ambassador used the cover of a lecture tour, addressing groups of German officers and occupation officials on the subject of living space and imperialism. In between lectures, he conferred privately with Falkenhausen in Brussels and Witzleben in Paris, receiving a favourable impression of both of them, especially of the latter. Shunted to the sidelines in France while his fellow field marshals were fighting great battles in Russia, Witzleben was thirsting for action. He told Hassel that the idea of isolated action was utopian. Direct action to overthrow Hitler was the only solution, and he was willing to play a leading part. Probably the best time to strike would be during the summer of 1942, when the German offensive in Russia was resumed. To prepare for the day, he intended to be in top physical trim and would have a minor operation to put him in shape. Unfortunately for the field marshal and his co-conspirators, this decision had disastrous consequences. Like Frederick the Great and many others, Witzelben was troubled by hemorrhoids. The operation to correct this painful and annoying condition was a routine case of surgery, to be sure. But when Witzleben took a brief sick leave in the spring to have it done, Hitler took advantage of the situation to retire the field marshal from active service, replacing him with Rundstedt, who had no stomach for conspiring against the leader who had so recently treated him so shabbily. Thus, the plotters found their chief hope in the army to be a field marshal without any troops at his command. Without soldiers, no new regime could be established. The leaders of the conspiracy were greatly disheartened. They kept meeting clandestinely and plotting, but they could not overcome their discouragement. It seems at the moment, Hassel noted at the end of February 1942, after one of the innumerable meetings, that nothing can be done about Hitler. A great deal could be done, however, about straightening out their ideas concerning the kind of government they wanted for Germany, after Hitler finally was deposed, and about strengthening their helter-skelter and so far quite ineffectual organisation so that it could take over that government when the time came. Most of the resistance leaders, being conservative and well on in years, wanted, for one thing, a restoration of the Hohenzollern monarchy. But for a long time, they could not agree on which Hohenzollern prince to hoist on the throne. Popitz, one of the leading civilians in the ring, wanted the crown prince, who was anathema to most of the others. Schacht favoured the oldest son of the crown prince, Prince Wilhelm, and Gerdeler, the youngest surviving son of Wilhelm II, Prince Oscar of Prussia. All were in accord that the Kaiser's fourth son, Prince August Wilhelm, or Auvi, as he was nicknamed, was out of the question since he was a fanatical Nazi and a Gruppenführer in the SS. 
By the summer of 1941, however, there was more or less agreement that the most suitable candidate for the throne was Louis Ferdinand, the second and oldest surviving son of the Crown Prince. Then just 33, a veteran of five years in the Ford factory at Dearborn, a working employee of the Lufthansa Airlines, and in contact and in sympathy with the plotters, this personable young man had finally emerged as the most desirable of the Hohenzollerns. He understood the 20th century, was democratic and intelligent. Moreover, he had an attractive, sensible and courageous wife in Princess Kira, a former Russian Grand Duchess, and an important point for the conspirators at this stage, he was a personal friend of President Roosevelt, who had invited the couple to stay in the White House during their American honeymoon in 1938. Hassel and some of his friends were not absolutely convinced that Louis Ferdinand was an ideal choice. He lacks many qualities he cannot get along without, Hassel commented wryly in his diary at Christmas time, 1941, but he went along with the others. Hassel's chief interest was in the form and nature of the future German government, and early the year before he had drawn up, after consultation with General Beck, Gerdeler and Poppitz, a programme for its interim stage, which he refined in a further draft at the end of 1941. It restored individual freedom and pending the adoption of a permanent constitution provided for the supreme power to rest in the hands of a regent, who, as head of state, would appoint a government and a council of state. It was all rather authoritarian and girdler, and the few trade union representatives among the conspirators didn't like it, proposing instead an immediate plebiscite so that the interim regime would have popular backing and give proof of its democratic character. But for the lack of something better, Hassel's plan was generally accepted at least as a statement of principles until it was superseded by a liberal and enlightened programme drawn up in 1943 under pressure from the Kreisau Circle, led by Count Helmuth von Moltke. Finally, that spring of 1942, the conspirators formally adopted a leader. They had all acknowledged General Beck as such, not only because of his intelligence and character, but also because of his prestige among the generals his good name in the country, and his reputation abroad. However, they had been so lackadaisical in organising that they had never actually put him in charge. A few, like Hassel, though full of admiration and respect for the former general staff chief, had some doubts about him. The principal difficulty with Beck, Hassel wrote in his diary shortly before Christmas 1941, is that he is very theoretical. As Poppet says, a man of tactics but little will power. This judgment, as it turned out, was not an ungrounded one, and this quirk in the general's temperament and character, this surprising lack of a will to act, was to prove tragic and disastrous in the end. Nevertheless, in March 1942, after a good many secret meetings, the plotters decided, as Hassel reported, that Beck must hold the strings, and at the end of the month, as the ambassador further noted, Beck was formally adopted as the head of our group, Still, the conspiracy remained nebulous, and the air of unreality which surrounded even the most active members of it from the first hangs over their endless talk as one tries to follow it at this stage in the records they have left. Hitler, they knew that spring, was planning to resume the offensive in Russia as soon as the ground was dry. This, they felt, could only plunge Germany farther toward the abyss. And yet, though they talked much, they did nothing. On March 28, 1942, Hassel sat in his country house at Ebenhausen and began his diary. During the last days in Berlin, I had detailed discussions with Jessen, Beck and Gerdeler. Prospects not very good. How could they be very good, without even any plans to act? Now, while there was still time. It was Adolf Hitler who, at this unfolding of spring, the third of the war, had plans and the fierce will to try to carry them out the last great German offensives of the war. Although the Führer's folly in refusing to allow the German armies in Russia to retreat in time had led to heavy losses in men and arms, to the demoralisation of many commands, and to a situation which for a few weeks in January and February 1942 threatened to end in utter catastrophe, there is little doubt that Hitler's fanatical determination to hold on and to stand and fight also helped to stem the Soviet tide. The traditional courage and endurance of the German soldiers did the rest. By February 20th, the Russian offensive from the Baltic to the Black Sea had run out of steam, and at the end of March the season of deep mud set in, bringing a relative quiet to the long and bloody front. Both sides were exhausted. 
A German army report of March 30th, 1942, revealed what a terrible toll had been paid in the winter fighting. Of a total of 162 combat divisions in the east, only eight were ready for offensive missions. The 16 armoured divisions had between them only 140 serviceable tanks, less than the normal number for one division. While the troops were resting and refitting indeed long before that, while they were still retreating in the midwinter snows, Hitler, who was now commander-in-chief of the army as well as supreme commander of the armed forces, had been busy with plans for the coming summer's offensive. They were not as ambitious as those of the previous year. By now he had sense enough to see that he could not destroy all of the Red Armies in a single campaign. This summer he would concentrate the bulk of his forces in the south, conquer the Caucasus oil fields, the Donetsk industrial basin and the wheat fields of the Kuban and take Stalingrad on the Volga. This would accomplish several prime objectives. It would deprive the Soviets of the oil and much of the food and industry they desperately needed to carry on the war, while giving the Germans the oil and the food resources they were almost as badly in need of. If I do not get the oil of Mykop and Grozny, Hitler told General Paulus, the commander of the ill-fated Sixth Army, just before the summer offensive began, then I must end this war. Stalin could have said almost the same thing. He too had to have the oil of the Caucasus to stay in the war. That was where the significance of Stalingrad came in. German possession of it would block the last main route via the Caspian Sea and the Volga River, over which the oil, as long as the Russians held the wells, could reach central Russia. Besides oil to propel his planes and tanks and trucks, Hitler needed men to fill out his thinned ranks. Total casualties at the end of the winter fighting were 1,167,835, exclusive of the sick, and there were not enough replacements available to make up for such losses. The high command turned to Germany's allies, or rather, satellites for additional troops. During the winter, General Keitel had scurried off to Budapest and Bucharest to drum up Hungarian and Romania N soldiers, whole divisions of them for the coming summer. Goering and finally Hitler himself appealed to Mussolini for Italian formations. Goering arrived in Rome at the end of January 1942 to line up Italian reinforcements for Russia, assuring Mussolini that the Soviet Union would be defeated in 1942 and that Great Britain would lay down her arms in 1943. Ciano found the fat, bemedalled Reich Marshal insufferable. As usual, he is bloated and overbearing, the Italian foreign minister noted in his diary on February 2nd. Two days later, Goering leaves Rome. We had dinner at the Excelsior Hotel, and during the dinner Goering talked of little else but the jewels he owned. In fact, he had some beautiful rings on his fingers. On the way to the station he wore a great sable coat, something between what automobile drivers wore in 1906 and what a high-grade prostitute wears to the opera. The corruption and corrosion of the number two man in the Third Reich was making steady progress. Mussolini promised Goering to send two Italian divisions to Russia in March if the Germans would give them artillery, but his concern about his allies' defeats on the Eastern Front grew to such proportions that Hitler decided it was time for another meeting to explain how strong Germany still was. This took place on April 29th and 30th at Salzburg, where the Duce and Ciano and their party were put up in the Baroque Palace of Klesheim, once the seat of the Prince Bishops, and now redecorated with hangings, furniture and carpets from France, for which the Italian foreign minister suspected the Germans did not pay too much. Ciano found the Führer looking tired. The winter months in Russia have borne heavily upon him, he noted in his diary. I see for the first time that he has many grey hairs. There followed the usual German recital sizing up the general situation, with Ribbentrop and Hitler assuring their Italian guests that all was well in Russia, in North Africa, in the West and on the high seas. The coming offensive in the East, they confided, would be directed against the Caucasus oil fields. When Russia's sources of oil are exhausted, Ribbentrop said she will be brought to her knees. Then the British will bow in order to save what remains of the mauled empire. America is a big bluff. Chiano, listening more or less patiently to his opposite number, got the impression, however, that in regard to what the United States might eventually do, it was the Germans who were bluffing, and that in reality, when they thought of it, they feel shivers running down their spines. It was the Führer who, as always, did most of the talking, 
Hitler talks, 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 Ciano wrote in his diary. Mussolini suffers he, who is in the habit of talking himself, and who instead practically has to keep quiet. On the second day, after lunch, when everything had been said, Hitler talked uninterruptedly for an hour and forty minutes. He omitted absolutely no argument. War and peace, religion and philosophy, art and history. Mussolini automatically looked at his wristwatch. The Germans poor people have to take it every day, and I'm certain there isn't a gesture, a word or a pause, which they don't know by heart. General Jodl, after an epic struggle, finally went to sleep on the divan. Keitel was reeling, but he succeeded in keeping his head up. He was too close to Hitler to let himself go. Despite the avalanche of talk, or perhaps because of it, Hitler got the promise of more Italian cannon fodder for the Russian front. So successful were he and Keitel with all the satellites that the German high command calculated it would have 52 Allied divisions available for the summer's task, 27 Romanian, 13 Hungarian, 9 Italian, 2 Slovak and 1 Spanish. This was one quarter of the combined Axis force in the east. Of the 41 fresh divisions which were to reinforce the southern part of the front, where the main German blow would fall, one half or 21 divisions were Hungarian, 10, Italian, 6, and Romanian, 5. Halder and most of the other generals did not like to stake so much on so many foreign divisions whose fighting qualities, in their opinion, were, to put it mildly, questionable. But because of their own shortage of manpower, they reluctantly accepted this aid, and this decision was shortly to contribute to the disaster which ensued. At first, that summer of 1942, the fortunes of the Axis prospered. Even before the jump-off toward the Caucasus and Stalingrad, a sensational victory was scored in North Africa. On May 27, 1942, General Rommel had resumed his offensive in the desert. Striking swiftly with his famed Africa Corps, two armoured divisions and a motorised infantry division, and eight Italian divisions, of which one was armoured, he soon had the British Desert Army reeling back toward the Egyptian frontier. On June 21st he captured Tobruk, the key to the British defences, which in 1941 had held out for nine months until relieved, and two days later he entered Egypt. By the end of June he was at El Alamein, 65 miles from Alexandria and the delta of the Nile. It seemed to many a startled Allied statesman, poring over a map, that nothing could now prevent Rommel from delivering a fatal blow to the British by conquering Egypt, and then, if he were reinforced, sweeping on northeast to capture the great oil fields of the Middle East, and then to the Caucasus to meet the German armies in Russia, which already were beginning their advance toward that region from the north. It was one of the darkest moments of the war for the Allies, and correspondingly one of the brightest for the Axis. But Hitler, as we have seen, had never understood global warfare. He did not know how to exploit Rommel's surprising African success. He awarded the daring leader of the Africa Corps a field marshal's baton, but he did not send him supplies or reinforcements. Under the nagging of Admiral Raider and the urging of Rommel, the Führer had only reluctantly agreed to send the Africa Corps and a small German air force to Libya in the first place, but he had done this only to prevent an Italian collapse in North Africa, not because he foresaw the importance of conquering Egypt. The key to that conquest actually was the small island of Malta, lying in the Mediterranean between Sicily and the Axis bases in Libya. It was from this British bastion that bombers, submarines and surface craft wrought havoc on German and Italian vessels carrying supplies and men to North Africa. In August 1941, some 35% of Rommel's supplies and reinforcements were sunk. In October, 63%. By November 9th, Ciano was writing sadly in his diary. Since September 19th, we had given up trying to get convoys through to Libya. Every attempt had been paid for at a high price. Tonight we tried it again. A convoy of seven ships left, accompanied by two 10,000-ton cruisers and ten destroyers. All I mean, all our ships were sunk. The British returned to their ports at Malta after having slaughtered us. Belatedly, the Germans diverted several U-boats from the Battle of the Atlantic to the Mediterranean and Kesselring was given additional squadrons of planes for the bases in Sicily. It was decided to neutralise Malta and destroy, if possible, the British fleet in the eastern Mediterranean. Success was immediate. By the end of 1941, the British had lost three battleships, an aircraft carrier, 
Two cruisers and several destroyers and submarines, and what was left of their fleet was driven to Egyptian bases. Malta had been battered by German bombers day and night for weeks. As a result, Axis supplies got through in January, not a ton of shipping was lost, and Rommel was able to build up his forces for the big push into Egypt. In March, Admiral Raider talked Hitler into approving plans not only for Rommel's offensive toward the Nile, Operation Ida, but for the capture of Malta by parachute troops, Operation Hercules. The drive from Libya was to begin at the end of May, and Malta was to be assaulted in mid-July. But on June 15th, while Rommel was in the midst of his initial successes, Hitler postponed the attack on Malta. He could spare neither troops nor planes from the Russian front, he explained to Raider. A few weeks later, he postponed Hercules again, saying it could wait until after the summer offensive in the east had been completed and Rommel had conquered Egypt. Malta could be kept quiet in the meantime, he advised, by continued bombing. But it was not kept quiet, and for this failure either to neutralise it or to capture it, the Germans would shortly pay a high price. A large British convoy got through to the besieged island on June 16th, and though several warships and freighters were lost, this put Malta back in business. Spitfires were flown to the island from the US aircraft carrier Wasp and soon drove the attacking Luftwaffe bombers from the skies. Rommel felt the effect. Three quarters of his supply ships thereafter were sunk. He had reached El Alamein with just 13 operational tanks. Our strength, he wrote in his diary on July 3rd, has faded away. And at a moment when the pyramids were almost in sight, and beyond the great prize of Egypt and Suez, this was another opportunity lost, and one of the last which Hitler would be afforded by providence and the fortunes of war.